So on today's episode, I'm actually gonna break out a tape measure. So uh, click subscribe, like the video, comment below, give me some feedback, do the entire YouTube thing, and uh, let's follow along. I'm gonna uh, get past the low tech and get into some pretty high tech today. Let's get at it. So the way I started building this car, the rockers give me basically a blank slate. Five inch wide, half inch plate, and everything else I can design from nothing. Now, before I start building the floor, I wanna make sure I got an idea what the frame's gonna be. So I sat down with a tape measure and measured out the rockers. Measured out the axle center line there. And we're gonna take this, we're going to take an image of the side of the car that we pulled out of the opening video and we're going to inlay it in the computer. So this is the point where I give everybody a fair warning. This is not the typical video that you've seen. This is going to be more of a CAD tutorial. So I do all of my CAD work in Rhino 3D. It's what I'm familiar with and what I'm uh, well versed in. There's plenty of programs on the market that work. Uh, this is just my preference. So what I've done is I've opened up a new file, brought it up into the top view here, and I've eliminated all of the grid lines. Um, when I'm working like this, it just seems like the grid lines are easier to get rid of. They distract from the lines. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm referencing my drawing and I'm drawing out rectangles. Um, we've got the basic rectangles, the videos that were shown there. The driver's side is 58 and 13 16 by 5 inch. Passenger side is 58 and 9 16 by 5 inch. So I'm laying them out here. Now, they're not parallel. They're both tapered wider toward the rear. So the easiest way to do this, knowing that the front points line up, is to move them together. And if I go back to my drawing, I can move them 37 and 5 sixteenths apart. Now, this is where we go back to elementary school, even. Um, basic geometry. Our measurements create triangles. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating two circles. Using the radius, I can use my diagonal measurements. Um, from the point there, I need 71 and 3 quarters. And we know that the second circle has to be the radius equal to the piece that we're working on. Knowing that, if we rotate this rectangle from the point in the front, we purely need to rotate it down to where the two lines intersect. And we know that that piece is already right because a triangle only needs three point controlled points and we can work start off of the two front ones that we've already established. We're going to repeat this process on the other side. Circle using the radius. The first one set to the length of the piece. The second one the radius is set to, in this case, 71 and 5 sixteenths. And we can rotate our passenger side rocker out until it lines up. Sometimes my voice is going to get ahead, sometimes it's going to fall behind. Hope everybody can follow along as I'm going here. But what I'm doing is I've deleted the circles. I can go back in, select dimension linear, and I'm going to measure between these two points, which gives me 44.82 and considering that my tape measure measurement was 44 and three quarter, I'm gonna say that's good enough. Unfortunately, as I did the screen grab, it seems that it doesn't show any of the drop down menus. It's a glitch in the computer. So I'll have to explain some of it as I go here. So what I've done is I've gone up into view and I've selected back, background bitmap. And I've uploaded a fit photo that I went in and removed the background in, in paint.net. It works just like Photoshop. This is the side picture of the car from the opening video. 
I can go into my background bitmap and align it. We select the move function up top and we're going to move it until the corner of the rocker is in line with the lower rocker panel here. And then we can select scale to make sure that the, raw, the background bitmap is the same size as the piece we're working on. Now, photos aren't two-dimensional like we're working in here. So you need to remember that it's not an exact science in this case. It is purely a tight guideline. It gets me close. Um, when I was measuring on the car, we can check our dimension here. We measure from the back of the rocker to the center line of the notch. I measured 18 inches on the car. Now I'm looking at this and it says 17 and a quarter. I could be out, my background bitmount could be out, but we are in the right ballpark, which is close enough for what we're going to do here today. Now everything I'm doing, I'm self-taught here. I got my first CNC plasma table a little over a dozen years ago. Before that, I had started teaching myself to program files for someone else that was cutting parts for me. Um, I learned through trial and error and a little bit of YouTube tutorials for help. So my methods here are have in the past upset engineers and designers. Um, it works for me, it works for my purposes, and I can make some pretty cool three-dimensional pictures. I've drafted entire rooms, buildings, vehicles. Um, I also have a good collection of parts. So some of them are CAD files from SEMA, some of them are from Designers Online. There's a great resource. I like to use grabcad.com and download files. I've pulled stuff from all over. This file that I'm inputting right now happens to be a small block Chevy with a turbo 350 transmission. Seems like a good drivetrain to model in there. Um, I know it's dimensionally accurate. I've built parts off of it before. So what I'm doing here is I want it mounted at center. So I'm drawing a simple line between the two rockers. And I'm going to select at the center of the output. And line it up with the center of what is now my car. Now obviously this doesn't align vertically or front to rear. But if I move into a side view, I can type move. Click on my start point and drag it in the direction I want until I get it close um, there's not exactly a hard science to this this is kind of by feel experience the nice thing is is that i can see where everything's going to go and i know my angle's wrong so if i start to type ro rot rotate pops up we're going to select that function and i'm rotating it using the bottom rear corner of the oil pan as my start point until it looks like the drivetrain's at about the angle we want and looking at the fact here, I just wanted to move it so that the oil pan, transmission pan are off the ground, but as low as possible. Tuck tight to the firewall. Obviously looking at this, I might have to dish my firewall a little bit for my distributor cap. If I have to, I have to. I can make that decision when I get there. You'll see later that this isn't going to affect the frame at all in this case, but it's nice to have the model. Um, with my collection of models, I've got wheels, tires, so find something around the 28-inch tall mark that I wanted. In this case, it happens to be a steel wheel with a 28 by 125 slick. And we can see that my background bitmap is probably a little bit off scale. If this was the full 18 inches that we wanted, I know that a 28-inch tire will tuck into that opening. Perspective might be off a little bit, so... We can't take that as a hard rule that this isn't going to work. Now, I know that the tire has to be outside the body on the car here. I've added a rear center line there so we can get a good guideline. The front one gets lo got lost in the middle of the transmission there and I still want to be able to access it. So another line at the back. These are lines we can delete later. They don't really do anything except give us lines. And I can mirror this rear tire. Now the car has tires on both sides of it. And in the front, the tires aren't really as much of a big deal. Any much more than a visual aid. 
but what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to upload a front tire. Let's see, we go into the file, import, and this is me opening up my file folders. The location, I just had it saved to the desktop so it was easy to find, but unfortunately you can't see that. Um, this front wheel, the reason it's red is because the file that I, I found, it was a red tire. The tire is actually off of a Corvette model that I had found, and it's the same wheel as the rear that I've sectioned down. Instead of a 10 inch wide wheel, I think I narrowed it to about 8 inches. I cut a section out with the software on another open file. We can see that this wheel is actually a passenger side wheel. So we either need to rotate it or we need to move it out to the passenger side as I'm doing. Um, but what I did is I took my tire and I had scaled it. I selected the tire. I scaled it from the center point. It's similar to doing the background bitmap but I scaled it down until it was pretty much appropriate on the wheel. Again, I haven't exactly picked out tire sizes or anything yet, so it's just my best guesstimation. It's a visual aid. I mean, in real life, I've made these out of cardboard and bolted them to the side of the car so that I can see what I can, I'm doing. Um, this is a little more accurate, but I can actually check clearances and stuff here pretty easily. I wanted to get an idea of how wide the outside of the car is going to be. I mean, 82 inches, we're talking in the ballpark of 7 feet. It's wide, but it's not ridiculous. But up front, the way I have those tires sitting, I think this will be a little bit too much stagger. Um, probably going to end up running a beam axle up front in the neighborhood of, you know, somewhere between... 44 and 8 inches wide at the kingpin, I would guess. So, I'm going to move the tires out here a little bit so that I can uh, get a little more accuracy here when we're building the frame. The only real concern here is that the axle clears and that I've got steering room for the tires, which I don't think it's going to be an issue because in the front you'll see that the beam, the front. Uh, uh, frame rails are just going to be straight beams so I can pretty much cut them off wherever I need but this is essentially what the car is going to look like aired out um, and now that it looks like this this is kind of what I was shooting for I mean in my head this is what I visualized um, on the right side of the screen we have our layers so what I've done is I've added a new layer and I've called it Oh, what did I call it? I called it wheels. Um, if I select the rear wheels, just with a select bar like we've used in any file folder, and hold down shift and select the front wheels, it allows me to add to my selection. And I'm going to go over to the side there to where it says layers, and I'm going to use the drop-down menu and click on the, the wheels layer. And uh, we're going to add another layer here, and we're going to call it drivetrain. And we're going to repeat this process. Now, what this allows me to do is if I actually go on that menu there, there is a little light bulb. If I click the light bulb, it allows me to make a layer invisible. Therefore, the parts are still there. They just disappear from view. You can't select them. They do not get in your way. This comes in super handy when you're programming. So with our wheels on a layer, our drivetrain on a layer, um, this adds to our capability. This is stuff that we can have at a simple click, but we uh, we don't need it interfering. You know, imagine being able to pull your motor and trans out to build a cross member, and all you had to do was left click on a light bulb. Um, I wish we had this capability in real life, but you can see on the side of the screen here, I've added one more layer. We're going to call it rear axle because I happen to have a file that'll work for that as well. Now, when I open up this file, uh, you'll see that something got lost in translation, depending on where I'm getting my files from. Some are metrics, some are imperial, some I've converted. Um, sometimes when I import them, I forget what format I'm bringing them into. So in this case, my axle happened to be in metric in millimeters which obviously uh, an axle with a uh, 
60 millimeter wheel mount surface is not going to help us at all. I wasn't sure on the dimensions of the wheel mount, but if we go back to the scale function, same as the background bitmap, same as we scaled the red tires onto the rim, I know that this axle had a three inch axle tube from my own memory. So I can select the entire axle, scale the axle to, or scale it to three inch using my axle tube as my baseline. And I know that that's going to be right. Now, it's not like I'm building anything directly off of this, but this is a nine inch with disc brakes. It gives me something that represents what I would have in the back. I'm not sure if I'm going to run a nine inch, but it's a really good guideline for me. Um, for whatever reason, I had the axle saved upside down, which doesn't help us a whole lot. But I got it flipped over here, and just like on the rocker panels, I just added a line from rotor to rotor so that I can find center line of this axle because it, uh, it it's just nice to have it modeled up in the center. Now... The downside to doing this is, as I said, you lose that center line, like the one under the transmission. I lost this center line here, so I moved the line out, but I can select everything all at once. Move from, I'm going to move this piece from the center line of that line out to the center line I established between my rockers. And same as the drivetrain, we're basically going to drag this into place. I mean, all I'm looking to do is get it as close as reasonably possible to the center line of the wheel. Um, once I've got it there, I'll be happy with that. I, I'm not stressing how exact it is. It's uh, a little bit of ADHD, OCD going on here, trying to drag it pretty close, but realistically, close is good enough in this case. Um, I just want to be able to put some metal around it virtually, and this is going to allow me to do that. And now that we've got this laid out, we can go into our three-dimensional view. This is the beauty of this. Those rockers exist. The other parts are parts that I can picture that I have had in my hands in real life. And this is the basis for where we're at today. Now, and up until this point, all I've been working with is the rockers that I have in real life and parts which I've touched in real life that I happen to have saved in my I can use it in files folder. This is where we're going to start putting together something that doesn't exist at all. So I go into my solid menu, I go solid box, and it'll be uh, length, width, and height. I can type in, in this case I went a 60 inch long, my rockers are 58 inches, so I went with 60 inch long, 2 by 4 Right now this is just a solid box. Um, I'll show you how we deal with that later, but for modeling purposes, there's nothing else needed. We don't need to program out tube. I'm not worried about the rounded corners. We went in, we clicked on angle dimension and uh, selected our box tube and our rocker. It was a little bit around or a little bit under four degrees. I'm using four degrees as an angle measurement because I want this rotated out to the same dimensions as the rocker. This is going to come in handy later for body mounts. Uh, this has been my plan all along in my head. Um, so what we're doing is essentially establishing where we would want the frame to be. Now we're only going to work on one side of the frame for now because I can go into my mirror command, select everything, mirror it off a known center line, and we have our second side. So at this point, all we are concerned about is purely our frame, our uh, we're going to work on the driver's side here. Um, now, the thing is, is sometimes when you move your cursor around, you type in a 4, you have your cursor below. It's going to run it below. You run your cursor above, and you type in a negative number. And, you know, if you mess it up, you can delete it. You can do it again. Um, you can see, I, I've been doing this quite a few years, and I mess it up all the time. I had to take a few takes of some of the parts in this video as I slipped up or pushed the wrong button and accidentally deleted half my work. But it it's digital. This isn't even metal. Metal is easy to replace. This is even easier. I can physically just go in, not even physically, I can just go in and delete it. Um, now, we can see these pieces overlap here, the beauty of having multiple screens. 
I'm selecting everything here and I'm going to go into my solid down to edit tools and we're going to turn on control points. Um, what control points are is literally the corners of the pieces. So remember the circles, how we rotated things essentially via control points. What we're doing is we're grabbing the corners of this box and moving it to the intersection point. Um, the same idea as we were rotating the rockers earlier, but what that does is that take that solid piece and it has now cut it at the angle that meets the piece that it, it's cutting both pieces at the angle that they meet. This means that I can take this when I'm done and I can draw myself a blueprint for the material that I need to cut super simply. I can take all my measurements. I can measure my angles. I can set everything that I need to set. Now I wanted my frame rails in this case angled with the rockers. Outside of the rockers, I want the frame rails to continue straight. This makes my brackets easy. This makes my arch over top of my rear axle easy. It makes the front rise. Everything just gets easier if those frame rails are straight. So that's what I'm going to work with. And I had considered building some radius corners where these all meet, but in reality, these joints are just about hidden under the body, you know, basically hidden under the body. Um, you're not going to see the work. I want the frame to have a mandrel bent appearance. Um, what I was doing right there is I was actually measuring from the frame to the rocker and measuring from the inside edge of the frame to the exhaust manifold. Um, the two inches frame to rocker gives me enough room that I can put a small body mount in there along there. It'll be on the outside edge. Um, that's plenty of room for exhaust. I'm probably going to do some fender dump headers with a cutout that runs back to mufflers under the car. You'll see later, there's going to be plenty of room for this. I could run a 3x7 Magna Flow. Um, that'll tuck into a 4-inch space for sure. The floor is not going to dip below the frame rails. That'll be the lowest point of the floor. So a 3x7 would fit in there and not scrape on the ground. Um, but I mirrored the frame rails and now we have frame rails on both sides. Click on the little light bulbs and we can hide both layers. Now what we're staring at is just our drivetrain, our frame rails, and our rocker, which uh, you can see how much easier that makes that. I'm not trying to program around my rear wheels. Um, I'm playing with the commands here. Now the problem with the voiceover is I wish I had sourced out how to make the mic work on my computer as I went. Some of this, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, realistically, it doesn't need to. What I did here is I wanted, since I want the frame rails to look mandrel bent, I need a circle. Now, if I had just typed a circle in my side view, which on my computer shows up as my front view because of the position, but if I had just typed in a circle, it would have laid that circle out what they call C-plane, which would be the zero for that axis. Now, we don't know where zero is, but it's not going to be there. So what I did is I sent that circle, or started that circle from the corner of the frame rail. That way I knew it was in line. So these lines that I'm drawing now, I can bring it out from the frame rail. I can bring a line up to what they call tangent, which would be the naturally occurring line where from the point to the edge of the circle they line up. That means I have one continuous flowing shape. Um, because they're on the same plane, meaning if I look from vertical or I look from the back, that would appear as one line, I can get away with doing this quite easily. And same thing here, I'm just running a line from the bottom corner point straight back, just so that I can have an idea where they wanted the rear of the frame to be, um, because I'm kind of working backwards from everything here. I know what I want it to look like, but I didn't have known points in space. Um, if I click the radius function, um, you can select the radius. Now I'm trying to voice over this on a tiny little screen. I'm using a four or six inch radius. It'll sound really dumb when you look at this video and you realize that you can see it on the top left in 
the control bar there, it'll tell you what radius it is, but we can change the radius. And if I select off, if I start to type off, it'll give me the offset command. All I do is hit enter. In this case, I want to offset that line by four inches to give me my frame rail height. And that will now give me a consistent four inch separation through the curves, along the straights, along the curves, all the way over the back as if this was essentially a mandrel bent frame. Now this is just my outer lines working here. Um, so what I'm doing is I've click, I'm clicking on both of these and this shows me control points. Now we can use box tube to fill in the sections that are straight and we can see by the control points there are points where there are 90 degree lines and our corner radiuses come off of 90 degree sections. So the lines I'm adding in here these are spots where I can replace that with box tube and reduce the amount of plate I'm going to need. You'll understand all of this as I go now. You're going to have to kind of take it on faith for just a couple minutes more. But what I'm working with is these pieces here will be made out of plate. Um, you'll see the process right away. But in my head, because I've done this before, I know what I need to do. I removed the center lines with the trim tool and I'm going back in and I'm just drawing my rectangle back out again. The easiest way was to just draw using the line tool. Once you've connected a closed set of lines it actually unselects everything and it becomes a closed um, a closed unit and I have my rectangles here. I can go solid extrude linear which is going to expand my flat lines into a three-dimensional shape we want to extrude this by two inches to get our frame rail width and as you can see now we have box tube that matches our lower frame rails now all I'm doing here is using those as placeholders for something later. I got a few tricks to show you what's going on here, but what I've done is I've gone back in and I'm removing the line work that created these shapes. Now I don't need any of that line work because that line work was purely, purely to make our box tube. Our box tube is going to be cut from box tube, so all I need is a pure length. Um, those lines get in the way. Those curved lines, those are the ones we will build our plate off of. So that I actually need. So what I'm doing in the front here, I've brought a line straight out from the frame. And I'm, I'm eyeballing where I want the frame to be. And instead of trying to design an angled line that's going to snap to the engine um, and bring it off of the plane that we're working on, what I've done is I've just run a line straight vertical. I've run a spine straight out to the side, kind of eyeballing where things go, 45 degree angle, looked around right. So I went up, I went left, and then I can connect a line between the two, and we can go back and look at this and go, yes, that's about where I want it. That's basically under the oil pan. Depending on the pan, it'll clear front to rear. This is close enough that I'm comfortable my oil pan is within my frame. My background is I've done a lot of off-road. This is always in my mind. Here, I can build a skid plate that covers my transmission and my oil pan. So when this is aired out, I'm not worried about smashing at all. Process is the same as the rear. I went into my radius command, radius my lines, and I offset the four inches just like I did in the back. Now we need to remember is that if I'm using six inch, eight inch, 12 inch, it doesn't matter what it is, on my outer radius, when I offset it, the inside radius ends up different. So my radiuses are different because I know that in this case, if I run an eight inch radius on my outer, since it's offset by four inches, my inner radius would be four inches. Eight minus four is four. If I had run 12, it would have ended up eight. That means that by setting my radiuses based on that, I can actually go back in and I can have matching radiuses on both directions. Um, now, my pieces are different. It's, it's just the way it lays out. But visually, I think that going that way, it's appealing. The process that I'm going through right here, it's basically the same as the rear. I've made my pieces. I need my box tube. Now we can see that 
I've got the little stub of frame there sticking out that we had used control points to change earlier on the right of my cursor here. The piece that I just removed is going to be a straight box tube. Now those won't be two pieces, that will be one piece of box tube. Um, when I build this, I know that those two pieces will be combined as one. For modeling purposes, they're going to show up as two. Sometimes you got to make yourself notes, or realistically, I could have gone back in, deleted the box tube that we had adjusted, and I could program out a new one, and go back in, and I wouldn't have that confusion. For me, I'm going to stare at the blueprints and realize that it's one. If it's something that you're concerned about, go in and change the piece. I mean, you're following along here at this point, we're under half an hour to get to this point. It would literally, it, it's a 30 second change tops. If it's something you're concerned about or you're handing your blueprints off to someone and they can click on it and realize that it's two pieces and you think that they're going to make the mistake of making it two pieces, then go back in and change it. In my case, I'm not worried about it at all. Um, I know what I'm going to end up doing here, so... I'm comfortable with this, but as you can see now, this is the box tube portions of our frame. Um, the line work is about to become plate. Now this is part one of the video. Part two is going to show you all of the super cool in-depth stuff, um, tricks I've picked up over the years, ways to make this strong. We're not done yet, um, but right now this is kind of uh almost as far as we're ending up what i'm doing visually here is i've gone and i've selected our filler pieces these ones i took the solid tool extrude straight um and i've extruded them an eighth of an inch 0.125 remember kids fractions and decimal points converting them in measurements this is stuff we all asked ourselves what we'd use for in school I use this every single day of my life. Fractions, decimal, geometry, um, radiuses, diameters, angles. And I use this literally every day. Um, I've extruded these an eighth of an inch, 0.125 inch. And uh, we've mirrored those pieces across a known center. The known center here being the frame rails. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take all of the frame rail on the passenger side. I'm going to delete it. I'm going to select the frame rail from the driver's side. And we are going to mirror this so that I can stare at it for a minute visually. Look at what I've got going on. I can turn on my layers again. And I can now see what I'm working with. Now before everybody gets up and runs away, I know this is dragging on. So I'm going to end this video here. Um, thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this, subscribe to the channel, like the video, share it around, comment below. Let me know if you want anything a little more in-depth. I can do more videos. But I'm going to leave you with this image right now. This video is getting uploaded on Saturday morning. But believe me, there is a part two coming tomorrow. Tune in tomorrow. See you then.